So um, <clears throat> this session today is about uh, teaching our teenagers reading and listening skills. It has a slightly dramatic or enigmatic uh, title, whatever you want to um, uh, call it, and you will find out um, hopefully during the talk uh, why I have chosen this uh, uh, title. Uh, let's uh, briefly have a look at the um, table of um, uh, contents. So I'd like to start out by discussing briefly how we make meaning when we read or when we listen. So we'll be looking at the process of reading slash listening and understanding, um, first of all. Uh, we'll then... Um, literally look into the brain and uh, talk about um, what happens when we read and what happens when we uh, listen. That's something I, I personally find um, extremely fascinating. Um, the next point is about um, fluency and its importance when it comes to developing um, receptive uh, skills. Uh, from there, we will uh, look at the five things uh, one needs to know about teaching our teens reading and listening skills. And I'm delighted that I have the opportunity to use examples um, from the second edition of uh, Think. Um, uh, I will show both um, texts, but um, also share um, videos uh, so we will be looking at, at developing reading and listening or viewing uh, skills also. So let's get started. How do we make um, meaning um, when we read and listen? I would just like as, a, as an introduction, so to speak, just to remind um, uh, ourselves of the, the two very important areas when it comes to reading and also listening, of course, one is intensive and the other one is extensive uh, reading slash um, listening. It's not something that's new to you. I'm aware of that. I just like to, to um, um, sort of remind ourselves of this. So intensive reading um, or, or listening uh, involves learners um, um, reading in detail with a very specific learning aims and tasks uh, in mind, okay? In the classroom, um, this might include introduction of lexis, presentation of grammar, scanning, skimming, uh, checking, uh, comprehension. Um, extensive uh, reception, on the other hand, is about reading or, or listening for pleasure and interest. So when we, for example, read extensively, uh, then uh, what we uh, need to activate is general reading skills. And this normally means that the reader chooses what to read, where to read, um, when to read. And, and the reader in this case can also relax in the knowledge that normally when they are involved in some extensive reading, uh, they won't be questioned afterwards about their comprehension. So this is real life um, reading, we could um, say. All right, um, let me just, yeah, here we are. So um, th the next question really is, how do we actually make uh, meaning? We all use our reading skills all the time. You've probably, uh, depending on, on um, what time it is, uh, where you are at the moment, but but you've probably used your reading skills maybe ten times, maybe maybe even more just uh, today. Okay, so how do we do we actually make um, meaning? It's it's a fascinating process. This is not yet looking into the brain um, uh, and discussing what happens when we read, but but the meaning making process as such is an extremely um, uh, interesting process because it involves a lot of interaction between the reader and not just the reader but important um, aspects of the, the the readers and the listeners inner world and the text 
When it actually comes to reading, we go back and forth between our perception and, um, uh, sorry, between the text and our perception of it. Uh, with listening, this is slightly different, obviously, because we can't um, go back to an audio text and, and um, look at a piece of text again. We can, of course, when we are in control of the, the listening process, we can stop and rewind. But we can't when we go to a, to a lecture, when we listen to, to a radio play, when we watch a good movie, we can't normally go back because we want to, to listen to something um, again. So there it's um, interaction or we go back between our memory of what we've heard and our perception of it. Creating meaning is a constructive process that only works because we, as, as listeners and readers, we bring to the text, whether this is a, a piece of written text or, or a piece of audio or, or a movie or documentary, what have you, we bring to it our knowledge of the world. And our knowledge of the world uh, will actually uh, have a, ma a major significant influence on what we get out of a text, okay? And that's why, of course, no two people will get the same um, um, out of, of a text because our um, uh, knowledge of the world, our language level, our life experiences, our beliefs, our emotions, our expectations, they, they, they differ, and this is why what two people get out of a text is hardly ever the same. What happens in the brain when we read? Can you just speculate for a moment about this and maybe use the chat box and write down your... your thoughts there what what what's going on in our brains when we read i'm curious to to read your and hear because charlotte's going to read out your your uh, contributions here oh we've got quite a few herbert yet yeah. develop imagination processing creates images When we read on paper, uh, mainly you can make more synapses. We feed our creativity. Our brain creates imagination. We immerse in the story. Memories flash. Elicit situations. We have a brainstorming of images. Lots coming through Herbert. <laughs> Develop empathy, Lovely. live experiences. Increases our knowledge of ourselves and others. Searching for past knowledge on the topic. Interpreting content. We create all pictures. Lovely, wonderful. Well, thank, thank you so much. I mean, uh, what you're saying is also very, very important. And from what you're saying, we can actually see that it's not just a cognitive process, it's an emotional process at the same time. And it's also a process of creativity. Uh, we know that when we, for example, um, we are engaged in reading a, a novel and it's already past midnight and, and, and you're an avid reader and you just can't put that book down. Then, then you know it's not just about language. It's about creating um, a world. It's creating landscapes and, and, and people and sounds and, and, and voices and smells and tastes and what have you. And, and this all becomes possible, of course, because of what uh, happens in our brain when we read. There's one book that I would actually like to recommend to those who want to know more about um, what happens in the brain and also what kind of problems um, uh, can occur. It's a book by Sally Shaywitz, Sally and Jonathan uh, Shaywitz, and uh, it's called Overcoming Dyslexia. But it's not only about dyslexia, it's also about the latest breakthrough um, uh, findings uh, when it comes to scientific findings, when it comes to, to reading. 
And um, this um, research has actually um, uh, found a, a lot of um, also um, recognition in, in mainstream newspapers and, and magazines. There was a, an article on it uh, not too long ago in, in the Time magazine. And, and um, what we can see here from this um, um, graph is of this, this, this photo, this graphic, is that there are a number of, um, somebody used the word, um, we process language when we read. So there are a number of those processes. You can see they're numbered here and they have different functions. Number one produces phonemes basically. Number two, the left perito temporal area, you can see it more or less, uh, I don't know if you can see my cursor now, but on the left uh, side of the brain here, more or less in the middle or a bit towards the, the back of the brain. And this is about analyzing words. And then in the occipital lobe, we have what is called the automatic detector. So let's have a look at um, Sally Shewitz's um, finding uh, findings and, and let's discuss briefly what these different processes actually do. So the phoneme producer, this, this um, um, processor that um, was actually um, had the number one in this, in this um, graph, uh, this helps a person develop sounds, okay? So we look at a grapheme and we know the sound that goes with the grapheme, okay? Both when we read silently, but also when reading out aloud, okay? And this, this processor starts to analyze phonemes. Uh, and of course, they are the, the smaller sounds as we uh, know, uh, which make up words. So if, if a young learner, for example, looks at a word cat, um, this contains three phonemes, the k, the, the a and the t, and um, this is how they finally manage to blend the, the phonemes together. And um, of course, this is um, a processor that is particularly active in the brains of beginning readers. Adult, adults don't normally use this kind of processor a lot unless they come across a particularly um, complex and often long word. Um, uh, maybe when you think of words in, in chemistry or in, in medical science, when we come across a term which is derived from the Latin language, and then, of course, we do this faster than a beginning reader, but we also use the phoneme producer to actually sound out um, the word in this particular case. The second one is the word analyzer. And this word analyzer actually um, does a more complete analysis of the uh, written words, okay? What happens is the word analyzer looks at a whole word, pulls them apart into syllables and phonemes, and then links them together again. It's a process that actually goes faster than the kind of letter by letter or sound by sound sounding out process um, that um, the phoneme um, uh, producer or detector actually uh, gets engaged in. And then finally, the processor that um, we as experienced readers use most frequently, the so-called automatic detector, which involves or activates the left occipitotemporal area in the brain. Um, uh, so all these, these detectors are in the left um, uh, brain hemisphere. And this is about automatic detection of um, familiar words, okay? The more this automatic detector is activated, the better it functions. In other words, learners, uh, people who are 
um, experienced readers can often take in not just one word, but even two or three words at a time. And um, they breeze through print with or at a very, very fast uh, pace. So these are the, uh, the processes that need to be developed. And this is the process that the experienced reader will use most of the time. Um, but of course, as we know, um, some people have reading problems, even uh, teenagers have, have reading problems. And, and the latest um, science also shows very clearly what happens, for example, um, in um, the minds or in the, the brains of so-called dyslexic uh, uh, people. So what happens there um, is, as, as um, Sally Shavitz uh, points out, that uh, there is some kind of a, a glitch in, in the brain. And that kind of prevents us, um, if we belong to the group of the, the dyslexics, um, uh, prevents us from easily gaining access to the word analyzer and the automatic detector. So people who are dyslexic, um, they appear to compensate for that by leaning more heavily on the phoneme producer. That's why, of course, dyslexic people usually read much slower because they have to go through this process that normally only beginning readers um, activate, okay? And they also use um, uh, an activation of the right side of the brain uh, that um, um, process visual clues. So they look at accompanying pictures and they create their own images. And, and um, these images are often triggered by, by what they think they are reading but often their reading process lacks um, accuracy. And of course, the high-speed assembly line that is part of this um, automated um, process breaks down in, in people with um, uh, dyslexia, okay? And here is a question for you. This is all about fluency, of course. What is the problem if a learner lacks fluency in um, reading. Can you please just type your um, answers in the chat box? So Herbert, we've got lax understanding, misunderstandings, perhaps their understanding breaks, meaning is lost, miss the overall meaning, spacing out. Yes. Thank you. And, and here's my suggestion now. I would like to, to, yes, and they lose interest and become nervous. Absolutely. Yes. So I'd like to invite you to do a little ex experiment with me now. Um, nothing toxical. Um, what I would like you to do is I'm going to present uh, you with a text in a pretty unusual way, a word at a time. You will see slides with one word on each slide. Um, what I would like you to do is please read the text that uh, is made up by, by these individual words and remember as much as you can from this text. Um, but I would also like you to do a bit of process observation as teachers, you're good at that, aren't you? So I would like you to observe both your thinking. So what, what, what goes on in your, in your cognition? What are your associations? What are your thoughts? And I would also like you to observe your emotional uh, reactions, please. Okay, so here we go.
Okay, thank you so much. Uh, would you mind um, typing your thoughts um, first and then um, we'll have a bit of time to also have a look at uh, what you went through in terms of your emotional engagement, please. Do you want me to read these out, Herbert, some of them? The, the thoughts now, okay? It was difficult. Trying to hold on to past words and sentences. Yes. I got nervous. Thank you. Difficult to remember and understand. Takes a huge amount of effort. Absolutely right. It was slow. Totally true. I forgot in the beginning. It was quite hard to concentrate. Difference between... Yeah, absolutely. So thank you so much. So, so what you have just experienced in this, in this experiment is actually what uh, readers go through and it is frustration, isn't it? Um, very often, what readers go through that um, are not fluent readers, that um, have not mastered the reading process uh, fully. It's difficult to remember. And some of you have started to, to read, uh, to, sorry, type in their emotional reactions. Can we have a few more, please? Charlotte, I'll pass over to you again. Yeah, people getting bored, very frustrated, impatient, desperate, um, torture, Ooh, <laughs> trying to remember every single phrase is too tiring, frustrating, annoyed, angry, yeah, trying to remember, bored, mm. felt like it was too difficult, mm -hmm. no way to help. Yeah. Lovely, thank you so much. Well, actually, when we look at this text as a piece of text, it's actually not a very long text and and each of us would easily be able to 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 read and comprehend and remember this piece of text in no time really okay so it is really fluency that we need to to work on um, with our students very briefly before we uh, look at what we can do to foster uh, this uh, reading fluency. Uh, let's quickly look at what happens in the brain when we listen. It's actually the, the listening process uh, is all in all a process that is sort of, what shall I, how shall I put this, more direct because uh, listening doesn't have to go um, via turning abstract um, uh, signs, as in letters or, or words or sentences, into, into meaning. When we hear the, the word, when we hear a word, when we hear a sentence, when we hear sounds, they are usually a lot more or, or more directly associated um, with um, meaning. So let's have a look. Um, no, sorry. Here it is. Um, this is from a very recent 2018 um, study, a publication in, in current biology. Um, when listening to speech, and this is fascinating, the, the brain detects syllables and words that carry meaning, okay? Um, this is also um, uh, activating uh, the, the superior temporal lobes, again, in the, in the left brain's hemisphere. And what is extremely important here, and that's very important also in the reading process, by the way, uh, is that while we're listening, we engage in predicting what may come next. And in listening, this is even stronger because in reading, we can constantly also look at what we have just read. And as we discussed previously, that's not possible when we listen. So um, what is very, very important is a process of predicting what's coming next. And, and the other thing is fascinating, that um, the brain has this fascinating uh, capacity uh, to detect um, speech from noise, okay? So it takes about a tenth of a second for the brain to decide whether what we actually hear is just meaningless uh, noise or whether it is sounds or words carrying um, meaning and, and uh, an average um, rate, decoding rate, would be about three words uh, 
second. Okay, so now let us have a look at um, five things. Let me just check. Yeah, five things we should know, I believe, or we need to know. Okay, um, developing students' receptive skills takes plenty of listening and reading practice. And, and we must not forget that it takes both extensive and intensive um, uh, reading activation, okay? We must not forget about um, extensive reading. Of course, what we normally do in the classroom is, is um, intensive reading, but, but it's very important also to engage them in extensive reading. So let me present a few practical suggestions here. The first one would be, sorry, these are two. Um, the first one would be that extensive reading should be easy access, okay? Intensive, more challenging. So we really need to uh, hook our learners with easier texts first. Um, their, their reading text, Penny Ur has stressed this so many times, uh, extensive reading texts should be a little bit easier um, uh, than um, their own level of the language because we want them to be able to, to read fast. We want them to be able to read without problems and we want them to enjoy um, the, the reading process. Um, so this means um, graded reading graded readers. Um, when it comes to teenagers, the next stage for me is always um, YANs, young adult novels. Young adult novels are real books. Uh, the fascinating thing about young adult novels is that they usually um, easy access uh, literature. There are some that students can easily read when they are at B1 level. And, and this is um, uh, fascinating for students because it gives them a great um, a feeling of success uh, when, when they read their first real book and they get meaningful um, um, uh, ideas and content out of those, those books, of course. Uh, this contributes enormously uh, to their um, self-esteem and to their feeling of, of uh, success. I am able to read a real book in English, okay? Um, the easy reads and the good ones, of course, will mirror the thoughts and the emotions of uh, uh, teenagers. This is key for me. Um, the teacher plays an enormous role in motivating um, teenage students um, to read. Um, first of all, um, we can do that by sharing our own reading interests. And we need to show an interest in what they read. Um, uh, my, my colleague and co-author, Christian Holtzman, who is the expert on, on developing uh, reading with, with uh, teenage learners, he always says there is a book for each single teenager out there. We need to help them find it, okay? And once they... They, they, they have this, they found this book, then of course it's easier to motivate them and to, to get them to, to carry on and, and turn into avid uh, readers. So we need to make recommendations also that fit their reading interests. Um, reading aloud, of course, is not something that uh, we will practice a lot because our students really need to, to practice reading silently as it's much better for um, reading comprehension. And it's also in line with what almost all of them uh, will, will need to, to um, uh, master in, in life. But occasionally getting them to read out short texts is something that can be fun and can be very useful, especially if the texts they read out aloud are texts they have produced themselves. I'm not in favor of um, um, asking students to read out, say, texts in, in a course book uh, where, where everybody has the same text in front of them. There is no motivation for other students to listen while when uh, they read out texts they have produced, 
uh, that's a very, very different uh, process. Um, a few practical suggestions for um, listening. Uh, teacher talking time, that is often sort of kind of, um, well, um, almost ridiculed sometimes that you, there shouldn't be too much teacher talking time and there should be more student talking time. I agree, however, uh, teacher talking time can be quality time because we need to develop our students' uh, listening skills also in the classroom. I mainly recommend anecdotes and stories um, for that. Then um, I think we need to encourage our students um, to listen to the audios that go with graded readers these days. Uh, uh, all the, the good graded readers series uh, these days have, have audio um, input also. Um, I also recommend audio books, and there are, of course, also young adult novels um, um, and, and audio book versions of those. And one uh, little tip here, but it can be a very useful tip. Um, um, I recommend to students always that, and this can be done very easily when they have their, when with the, the, the um, workbooks, they also have listening activities. They can listen to a dialogue or to a, to a, a story or a, a narrative several times. Now, um, I don't know if you've ever um, used that or seen that in action. There is software these days, and some of it is free on the internet, that allows students to slow down the speed of the audio without changing the pitch, so you don't get this distorted um, um, uh, voice effect that we used to get when, when uh, playing an audio um, uh, faster or slower. Uh, this is great because it means they can listen to difficult pieces repeatedly and they can do that at a slower uh, pace. Um, the second point is, of course, about teens' emotional engagement. And this is very much in line with what many of you have said um, in your excellent contributions in the, in the chat box when I said, what, what happens when we read? How do we, um, what's the process in our brain? And, and many of you pointed out that it's not only a cognitive, but also an emotional process. And, and a lot of that depends on the right content. Um, so I think we, we need to make sure we offer a balance of what I call the wow factor, the gross effect, uh, the hero quality, and the thinking uh, provocation. So um, a few examples of texts here that I think are in line with, with um, what I am talking about here. Uh, these are examples from, uh, as I said, the uh, second edition of um, Think. Uh, this is from student book one, so A2, um, a text on this is a unit on you are what you eat. And uh, this is a text about um, eating creepy crawlies. Some people say they, they are the superfoods of uh, the future. And of course, um, students who come from countries and cultures that are not used to eating insects, um, uh, for them, uh, this has an enormous uh, gross um, uh, effect. Um, one thing I would like to point out here is that um, when we asked for feedback on the first edition of Think, um, one of the things that many colleagues asked for are um, videos, um, more videos, and, and also documentary style videos. So at the beginning of this unit, um, and at the beginning of most of the units, we have short um, videos that lead into the topic. And I'd just like to play a few seconds of this one here. So the, the topic of the unit, as I've said, is you are what you eat. Let's just quickly have a look here. A 
Around the world, there are a lot of different flavors, tastes, and smells, lots of different types of food, and many ways to eat it. You can try amazing street food in Asia or eat a typical American hot dog in New York City. Pizza is very famous in Italy, and in Mexico, you can try lots of different types of tacos. We love traveling, and so does our taste in different food. Nowadays, it's not difficult to find your favorite international foods and dishes. Okay, and so on, and your own country. So forth, I'll go uh, to the next text. In the meantime, I've had a chance to look at some of your comments. Um, uh, thank you very much. Irina is, is um, asking what I think of short stories. Absolutely um, great, of course. Um, but we do need to get them to read uh, uh, books also because longer, for example, narrative texts are, are very, very um, uh, important. Um, somebody was saying that it's difficult to find actually um, um, books that are easy access books and um, um, that are at the same time interesting for teenagers. I mentioned um, Christian Holtzmann. Um, I have forgotten the title of his book, but he, he wrote a book about uh, young adult novels and he gives the he gives summaries of about, I think, uh, 100 or 120 young adult novels and discusses how they can be used in the classroom. So Google for Christian Holtzman if, if that is something that you are interested um, um, in. Okay. And there was, yeah, the short story collection. I definitely agree. Yes, somebody said uh, LAN VCL, a uh, VLC, absolutely. Um, getting students or asking students to bring their favorite book to class. That's a wonderful um, um, uh, suggestion. Uh, thank you so much. Okay, so here we, no, sorry. Here we go on. Uh, this is the hero quality. Uh, it's a text that, that I think has the hero quality in it. This is um, about um, an, an emergency uh, service called Los Topos, and uh, the Spanish-speaking colleagues know that this is about um, topos is, is moles, okay? But they are human moles, and, and um, uh, they, this, this emergency uh, operation was set up in 1985 for the first time, when there was this terrible earthquake in, in Mexico uh, City, where many people were buried under um, uh, fallen buildings and, and needed help. And so this emergency operation saved the lives of uh, hundreds and hundreds of, of people. And uh, Los Topos um, are now helping whenever there is this kind of catastrophe anywhere in the world. Uh, they are the go-to um, uh, emergency uh, service. And this text is all about that. So um, what it helps um, uh, students to get in touch with is this, this quality, this um, quality of um, hero and heroine. And this is extremely important for uh, teenagers. It's usually um, big values and qualities such as love and creativity and courage and, and um, uh, solidarity and so on and so forth, okay? So this would be uh, this text from Think. Uh, this is a thinking provocation, um, a text about um, restaurants behind prison bars, the so-called uh, clink um, uh, prisons. Uh, several of those are in the UK, where people can actually um, uh, go to a prison and have a, 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 an excellent uh, meal, um, and they are they are served by prisoners, and the the chefs and the people working in the kitchen are prisoners uh, too. Of course, this is a provocative text, um, triggers off a lot of uh, good discussion uh, in a class. This is the wow factor, uh, and this is where the daredevil reference comes into, into uh, play. Um, people working as window cleaners, here in this case at the Gherkin in, in London, uh, which is 180 meters tall and 40 stories high, 
and uh, it talks about um, the kind of um, uh, qualities these people uh, need to, to have, okay? Um, encourage students to go deeper in their thinking about the texts they have read and listened to would be my next suggestion. And we can do that by asking the right um, uh, questions, of course. Um, inferencing questions, for example. Um, uh, these would include um, stimuli like, what does the writer suggest when he or she says, could paragraph X be interpreted to mean something, give you reasons? What's the author's opinion about? Quote from the text to support your view. Uh, those of you working with um, Think know, of course, that we have such and other questions that trigger thinking and help students to go deeper uh, in our post-reading um, uh, uh, tasks. Um, there is an excellent blog um, uh, by a practicing teacher online, Jessica Lifshitz. Um, uh, she is an expert in literature. She is an expert in getting her students to um, see texts. She reads it with them as mirrors of their lives. Uh, this is something I can highly uh, recommend. Um, uh, the, the next one is occasionally use surprise strategies for a change, okay? Uh, so let's make sure reading and listening doesn't become too samey in terms of the processes um, uh, uh, we engage our students in. This would be an example, uh, and this is from my recent book, 101 uh, Tips for Teaching Teenagers. Um, the strategy here is that you present the first paragraph of a text, um, sentence by sentence, okay? I'm not doing this with you now, but what I'm asking you, student, my students to do is just read this sentence and then pause for a moment and think about what you expect next. And then you present the next sentence. And then the next. And you give them a bit of time again. And then the next and then the next. And then you ask them to pair up and predict what's going to happen in the text. This is um, a real um, uh, story, uh, by the way. And it's also one of the stories that we have in, in uh, Think. It's again about uh, the, the hero and heroine factor. And the heroine in this particular case is this four-year-old girl who actually found 999 when her mother um, um, uh, was actually not feeling well at all. And there is this um, fascinating dialogue between the 999 officer, the police, police officer, and this four-year-old girl on the internet. You can get your students to, to find the authentic uh, dialogue. Uh, and it's, it's wonderful because her life, her, the mom's life was actually saved by this four-year-old um, girl. I'm not going into, into detail here. Um, this is something um, that is also from my book on uh, um, uh, tips for teaching teenagers. This is the super statement challenge. It's for, for listening. Um, it's part of this um, uh, presentation. So you can go back if you want to watch the presentation again, and you can look at it. It's, it's, I think it's, it's self-explanatory. Um, and last but not least, I would like to use uh, two minutes to present to you um, a short extract from two young text genres. One is a flog, uh, um, um, a young uh, person's flog, and one is a rap visualization. Uh, and we use these flogs to uh, develop life competences. So this is the page from the book. Uh, a lot of thinking here, critical thinking, um, collaborative listening, critical thinking, creative thinking, critical thinking, and thinking about social responsibilities. This is what this page does. And just a very short extract from this teenager's vlog. Sorry seems to be the hardest word 
So, my dad, sorry seems to be the hardest word from a very long time ago. And I think it must be true about sorry being the hardest word that is, because my dad never says sorry for playing it. But is it really so difficult? I mean, we all make mistakes, even me. And nobody's perfect, not even me. For example, most days, I annoy my little brother, annoy my big sister. So this is just an example, a short, very short extract. Uh, in our trial classes, these uh, vlogs were extremely uh, popular. We have, I think, quite cool uh, teenagers here, and they're good role models also for for young uh, for for your teenagers. And um, they are talking about topics that are very important, like, for example, saying sorry. Um, and then, very briefly, an example of such a grammar rap and a visualization of a grammar rap. Um, this one actually is where where are we here now this is um, present and past passive most of us like to see magic tricks we love to be fooled by them be fooled but every now and then my friend whoop, a trick can go wrong in the end the end uh, here's a story they say is true that happened in montreal uh-huh a magician's assistant named sarah fox was locked up in a wooden box. A box. Ooh. The audience watched in amazement wow. how the box was put on two chairs. Uh. Now the box and Sarah will be cut in two, said the magician. Watch what I do. Uh. Mm. Mm. Uh. Uh. A man in the audience was terribly shocked. Uh. He ran onto the stage and grabbed the saw. Uh -huh. He wanted to save the assistant's life. Uh. who, by the way, was the magician's wife. Woo! The man was absolutely furious. Uh. The police stopped him from using force. Yet he was arrested. And here's the moral. A trick. Just a trick. Of course. Okay, so I hope you, you like this. Um, uh, this is uh, what um, a neurobiologist actually says about this kind of uh, multi-sensory processing of grammar in this case. If learners are taught new information using a variety of senses, and of course it's auditory, uh, we have the, the lyrics, we have rhythm, uh, we have rhyme, and then there is the, the animation. So uh, the, the visual side of this also. And of course, a bit of fun. So also emotional engagement. Then learning will be stronger. Okay, so we're coming to the end of this um, uh, session, and uh, I would like to, to thank you for participating. I'll stop sharing my screen, and I'll hand you over to Charlotte. Hello, hi, thanks for a really interesting session, Herbert. And there's a lot of love in the chat for the grammar rap, which is great. <laughs> so a lot of people really like that. So um, we're going to dive into some of the questions you've been putting in the Q&A box now. Um, we've got quite a few questions, actually, Herbert. So um, I'm going to start with the first one. Um, now, this is about um, how can we become a better reader when we don't read during our most kind of sensitive early years, I guess, between the ages of two to seven. So if you pass that phase, maybe, and you haven't become a good reader, can you still become a really good reader? I absolutely believe so. I mean, you, you are, of course, right that the earlier, the better, and, and the early years are very, very important. But um, the human brain has this enormous uh, plasticity. And all the research actually uh, points in that direction that it's really never, almost never too late. It so depends on uh, helping our students to connect emotionally with what they are reading. And, and um, I, I so believe that it is still um, uh, possible. Okay, great, thank you. Um, then we've got a couple of other questions here. Mm -hmm. um, this is someone who is teaching adults with your Empower series, actually. Um, but it's about uh, how their students are not really improving their accuracy in pronunciation when reading or speaking. 
So they're asking, when can I expect a student to really improve? Or when, when will I just get more of an average result? That's, that's difficult to answer, mm. really, because it so mm. depends on um, the class you're teaching and on individual students also. Um, empower, and, and we can um, say that for sure, uh, on the whole gets excellent results. We can say it because um, it's a course that has this uh, digital um, um, assessment um, uh, feature so we can actually see what students achieve there uh, in their, in their uh, assessment practice and the results are fascinating. Um, but of course, that doesn't mean that uh, in, in your classroom, you, you are not uh, uh, coming across, you know, such problems. Um, I think we need to be, we need to be patient. Uh, we need to believe in our, in our learners. And we need to sort of also um, show them that um, uh, doing uh, practice testing can really help them to retrieve language. And the more they do that, the more accurate they will become with their learning. So if you're not using the, the assessment uh, feature and, and you have an opportunity to do that, in, in, encourage your students to do so. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you, Herbert. Um, so another couple of questions here. Um, this is quite interesting about um, what are your thoughts on having reading aloud sessions of book extracts in order to foster reading? Um, yeah, uh, as I said, uh, reading aloud is, is uh, good when we do it occasionally. Um, it's good um, practice of presentation skills because that's what reading out aloud actually is all about. We, we read out things aloud when we read to an audience that doesn't have the same text in front of them. So that's why I recommend, rather than reading out course book texts, I recommend um, um, getting students or encouraging students to read out texts they have um, uh, written, as I, as I said. We also need to give them a little bit of time before they read out their texts, because they need to look at their texts and maybe get an opportunity to ask the teacher for the pronunciation of, of um, a difficult word or, or a chunk of language or what have you, uh, so they can um, um, feel safe um, when they read out. Some people, especially the more introvert ones, uh, they, they find it difficult to read out in front of a whole group, so we need to give them um, uh, psychological support. But uh, if we do that, yes, occasionally, it's certainly a good idea. Hmm. Okay. Um, interesting one here about what happens to children's brains who read on screen and not on paper. Does it harm their brain? I have not come across any any research that that actually um, supports this theory. I have come across research that says that too much screen time is not good for mm -hmm. for students, especially for for younger ones. Um, uh, I'm personally, I still, I mean, of course I use, uh, 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 Kindle, uh, and, and, and screen reading myself too, but I personally, I still love books. I still love real books. Uh, so, um, it, it, it depends really. I don't think that, uh, their reading skills will suffer when they, when they use, uh, screens for that. Yeah, <laughs> I love books too, <laughs> to say. <laughs> um, okay, so um, another question here. How can I make my students to um, not think about grammar while they're speaking? Okay, very good point. Mm. Um, I, I'm not talking about your students here because I don't know your students. Um, uh, Salva, is it? Um, in general, people think about grammar a lot while they're speaking when they're scared of making mistakes in general. I'm not talking about your students, obviously, because I don't know them. So one thing for me as a teacher is to communicate to them very clearly that people make mistakes when they speak, even in their, in their own language. And um, it's uh, natural and it's a sign of learning uh, to make uh, mistakes. 
I would also suggest giving them lots of opportunities for pair work and group work, because this is when they can get into a flow a lot more easily without uh, worrying too much of uh, about maybe being being observed uh, too too critically. So those are my my recommendations there. Again, without without knowing your your students, of course. <laughs> Well, sadly, Herbert, that's that's all we've got time for today. <laughs> we've run out of time. We've got so many questions. Let's thank you so much to Herbert Puchter for a brilliant session. Pleasure. And we hope that all of you can join us for the next webinar that we have on Think Second Edition, which is at also at 3 p.m. UK time. And that's on the 21st of April. And that's with Mark Meredith. And that is called Waking Up from Webinar Fatigue, Five Things to Know About Motivating Your Teens. Um, so don't forget, you can visit the Think Second Edition Hub on our website at cambridge.org forward slash think2e, and we've put the link in the chat as well. And you can download samples and see all the components of the new course, and of course, speak to your Cambridge representative as well. And I just wanted to mention as well, there's a lot of information on our website about readers. So I know a lot of you, we've been talking about reading and readers today, um, but please do visit the website for that as well, because we do have young adult readers um, and graded readers there. So do take a look. Um, so thank you very, very much, everybody, and have a really great rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.